the Honorable Member for Yukon. Mr. Speaker, it's certainly a pleasure to rise today on, in support of Bill C-42. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm very happy to be joined by my uh, my colleague and friend from Wetaskiwin. We've got a number of members in the House of Commons on this side of the House who who uh, join me in the Hunting and Angling Caucus and do a lot of great work to uh, promote and preserve Canada's rich and proud heritage of, of hunting, trapping, sport shooting, and of course the uh, farmers who use firearms in Canada as a day-to-day -day tool and just to support a, a traditional and positive way of life and indeed a healthy way of life. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to take a little bit of time just talking about the value of, uh, of firearms and what role they play in the country, then specifically get into Bill C-42. But I was, uh, I was pleased to uh, substitute in on the Public Safety Committee when we were reviewing this bill, when the committee was undertaking this study, and we heard a lot of things from witnesses. And one of the things that stood out f uh, for me was some testimony from G Greg Ferrand, who, who represents the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And uh, Mr. Ferrand has tuned in clearly to, to a lot of the debate that's gone on with this bill, uh, understood what was going on, and, and, and in fact provided testimony as the government was introducing uh, legislation to get rid of the uh, long gun registry. But the one point that he made that really stood out was, was not only his reflection on the, on the size of the community in, in the province of Ontario that engages in hunting and trapping activities, but, but indeed re right across Canada, but he said, you know, we always get branded, and I say we, Mr. Speaker, because I come from a long, proud uh, tradition and history of, of hunting, grew up in the Yukon Territory, doing that is a wonderful way of my life as well, and, and will be well into my future. But, so I say we in that sense, we get branded by the opposition as being part of the gun lobby, as though that said in some sort of pejorative sense, and that's what Greg Ferrand said, that that we're always branded as, as a gun lobby, as though that's a bad thing. Well, let's talk about what the gun lobby is. And we say it with pride and we say it with the understanding on this side of the house of what exactly the gun lobby represents in Canada, what it means. That it's not this negative, uh, pejorative term that, that anybody should hide their head from and be, be ashamed of. Because what does that gun lobby do? That gun lobby participates in hunting heritage activities, contributes millions of dollars to conservation in this country. In fact, a recent study from the United States indicates that the number one group, four times, four times more likely to put their sweat equity and their cash into conservation than any other group going is the hunting group. Hunters. That's right, hunters. Four times more likely than any other group to put their money and their time and their effort into the valuable principles of conservation in this country. And that's something they should be applauded for. But instead, in return, what the opposition does is call them the gun lobby, as though that's some sort of uh, evil moniker that they should hide from, that they should have a shadow over them for. I say they need to stand up and be proud of that one simple fact that they're the ones out there on the land, they're the ones that first recognize the, the need for protection and preservation of our environmental heritage, they're the ones that recognize the depletion or the, or the need for, for conservation practices and principles to be put in place in a particular area or a particular region for a particular species, and it's not only the species that they hunt, it's the species and the streams and the habitats and the lakes and the forests that contribute to the life processes of the wildlife populations in our country. Those people are the ones that are responsible for the abundance and the protection and preservation of the wildlife and the lakes and the land and the, and the water in our nation. There's no accidental abundance of wildlife in Canada. There's no accidental protection and preservation of the wilderness, no accidental protection and preservation of the lakes and rivers and streams in this country. How does that happen? Where does that come from? The gun lobby, the hunters, the anglers, the trappers, the sports shooters and the athletes, the people that own guns and carry guns and spend time in the wilderness. Where do we get our safety laws from? We didn't create them here in the House of Commons, did we? No, anybody who owns a gun in this country knows, as ethical, safe, and law-abiding people in Canada, that they were the first to promote. They were the first to teach safe ways of handling firearms. They were the ones that developed the 10 rules of firearm safety that those on the other side of the house couldn't list three of, but probably 90% of the members on this side of the house know them inside and out as though it's a Bible toss. It was created 
by the hunting community and not by politicians. So we can thank the gun lobby and we can thank the conservationists, we can thank the hunters and the trappers and the sports shooters and the athletes in the country who use firearms in a, in a safe, responsible and ethical way every single day in this country for the fundamental rules that we now call laws. Isn't it ironic that we're in here standing up to defend laws or change laws or alter laws, the very laws that that community generated themselves? Why? Because they understand that firearms come with responsibilities. That firearms are a tool to protect and preserve an important way of life, but they do come with responsibility. And it was those groups, and those groups first, not the House of Commons, not provincial legislatures, but those group first that created those laws. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to talk about the, the measures we're taking in C-42 to ensure that those people that created those laws and do so much for the conservation, preser protect, preservation and protection of a great way of life in this country aren't burdened by red tape that's unnecessary, aren't considered criminals at first blush, and aren't considered criminals because of paperwork errors. So Bill C-42 will merge the possession and Paul licenses to give them more, more opportunity to, to own firearms, to, to simplify things, to reduce some of the red tape. It will merge some of the uh, ATT conditions and put them just on, uh, on one license so there's a condition for that license instead of a whole bunch of other papers of authorization that can inadvertently trip people up and in fact make it more difficult for law enforcement to determine whether or not a person's in legal possession of a restricted firearm when they're, when they're going to and from a range. It makes sensible uh, uh, measures so that so that they can transport uh, firearms to shooting ranges and gun shops and to to uh, to a police station or a point of entry. All these things that they could do in the fa in the past, but now now can just have that in one license instead of multiple licenses. It's also going to Bill C forty two is also going to take an, a, another step to balance the thing that we've been talking about, which is responsible firearm ownership and public safety. So Bill C-42 will introduce stricter penalties. Stricter penalties for people com com convicted of domestic violence. Stricter conditions on people that are involved in violent behavior and violent activity. And guess who's asked for that? The gun lobby, the firearms community, those responsible gun owners who are every much, every bit offended, if not more offended, by un illegal and unlawful use of firearms than anybody in this house could possibly be because it affects that community greatly when somebody steps out of line, when somebody uses a firearm in an illegal and inappropriate manner. It's not what they taught fundamentally long before we put laws in place, and it's not what they teach present day. So of course they're supportive of the stricter public safety measures that we're putting in place, but at the same time, they don't want to be treated as criminals for simple paperwork errors. So reducing red tape, formalizing some of the, uh, some of the provisions that, that didn't have clear guidelines before, like rules and regulations around uh, determinations what the CFOs can do, arbitrary decisions that were being made from one province to the next to the next that left everybody in a, in a, a state of confusion that, that, that weren't clear cut. Now this legislation is going to make it clear what CFOs can do, what terms and conditions they can put in place and what they can't so that firearms owners have certainty, so the general public has certainty, so that law, the law enforcement community has certainty. So that we don't see decisions like the ones made by a CFO in Ontario, where arbitrarily and on their own volition decided that any, any firearms owner wanting to go to a range with a restricted weapon needed an invitation from another range, which wasn't spelled out in any piece of legislation at all. It was an, an invention of the CFO. And this, clearly, firearms owners need to know what is a reasonable restriction and reasonable condition on their license that can't be made up. This bill will provide that. Mr. Speaker, I'll leave you with this thought that, that one in every five Canadians participate in hunting, trapping and sport shooting activities in this country. They contribute $15.5 billion to the Canadian economy. This side of the House and in this party, this government, we will stand up for law-abiding firearms owners every single day. And while I would like to encourage the opposition to get on board and, and, and help support these measures in C-42, it was clear from their testimony on committee that they really have no intention in doing that. That's all the better for us. We'll be the party that stands up for law-abiding firearms owners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question, come on tide. 
the Honorable Member for Marco Rel Fortin. Well, I appreciate the seriousness of my colleague across the way. Now, in terms of duck hunting in the regulations, it was decided that hunting uh, ri rifles couldn't have more than three cartridges in order to give a chance to the game to basically uh, get away. Now that's done for duck hunting, but unfortunately, unfortunately, there's the sale of far firearms where you can add 60 or 40, let's say, cartridges. So if you go hunting with 40, and that would be legal in passing. Now, perhaps uh, my colleagues across the way thinks it's funny, but the last time there were murders in Canada, it was this kind of weapon that was used. Now, uh, my colleague is a conservative across the way, so perhaps he doesn't understand the danger of firearms, but I would ask my colleague across the way if we can have serious regulations to avoid uh, the danger of these firearms, why can't that be applied to all firearms? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I think that just clearly illustrates for all Canadians how out of touch the opposition members are when it comes to this. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the reason that there are three shells allowed in a shotgun for the purpose of migratory bird hunting and that alone is so that when ducks get out of range, you're not firing a fourth and fifth shot at a duck and, uh, and wounding them. That's a, that's a condition put in place because of the ethics and values of the hunting community and, 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 a, and a responsibility that the hunting community wanted to put into law. I have never seen a shotgun in my life that holds 40 rounds. Like, that's just so absurd. It's, it's, I don't know whether to laugh or quiet, cry at that question. But, Mr. Speaker, if you want to just talk about extended mags, which I think the member was trying to drive at, but uh, it, clearly he then doesn't know that there's trap shooting in the Olympic Games, that, that, that athletes use shotguns with, with more rounds than that for. There's trap shooting at ranges where you can use more than three rounds. There's a whole bunch of purposes for shotguns that are not uh, illegal or, or this conspiracy theory that's being generated. I mean, it's just unbelievably bizarre to hear that any member in this House of Commons would think there's a shotgun in the market today that holds 40 rounds. It's it just, I'd love to see it, but it doesn't exist. Mr. Speaker, but this is clearly what we're up against. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Testimony, come on side. The Honourable Member for Trinity Spadina. Well, I, I listened to the member uh, from the North talk about the heritage and the cultural values and, and, and the, the safe use of firearms in, 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 in hunting and conservation and what have you, and, and I don't dispute that, that storyline, but in urban areas, um, we deal with the fact that, that since 1996, close to 65,000 guns, 44% of which are stolen or lost. 65,000 guns in this country have been lost or stolen. And those guns, when they show up in urban areas, cause trouble like we saw in my writing last week where a young man was shot and a house was shot up. And so the question is this, is that, is that how does making it easier to bring a gun into the city easier to travel around a city with a gun, easier to use a gun in a city, how does that make the residents in downtown ridings where no one is hunting duck, no one is hunting the raccoons, no one is going after the, the, the squirrel population, how do we make our cities safe while we also respect the, the, the culture and the values that were spoken to? The Honourable Member for Yukon, you have less than a minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I say this, we have very clear safe storage laws in this country. None of that is changing under Bill C-42. And Mr. Speaker, what, what the member's forgetting is that when somebody steals a gun, that's, that's criminal intent. And, and criminal purpose with those guns. And we have laws to deal with that. And I encourage the member to support all the initiatives that we put in place to deal with that criminal kind of behavior. Okay, but Mr. Speaker, members. let me quickly educate that member as he's shouting across the way about this one very fact. There are half a million hunters in the province of Ontario. And if he thinks none of them live in Toronto, he's out of his mind. And if that member thinks perhaps he's suggesting we should have some firearms repository outside of the city of Toronto that people could just store their, their firearms there. But he's, com he's clearly ignoring the thousands and thousands of lawful firearm owners that live in the city of Toronto and that engage in hunting activities right across the province of Ontario, right across Canada each and every day. We'll stand up for them while he ignores them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.